The brain isn't made of honey. You know, yeah. The brain is made of proteins and fats, especially a lot of fat. And you need these essential fats from meat in order to have sufficient brain growth. You don't get any of those from honey. You can take a newborn baby and the baby can breastfeed or bottle feed. And then within an hour, the baby is in a deeper state of ketosis than an adult would be after fasting for 20, uh, f for a full day. He was putting people's glucose down to like 20 milligrams per deciliter, which most people would say, you're unconscious, you're in a coma and you're gonna die. And these people, because they've been long-term fast adapted, which I would say ketone adapted, there appeared to be no deficit to cognition. I mean, that's a pretty bloody low level of, of glucose. I always like hearing um, some, especially some of the early proponents of, or, or people discussing a, a ketogenic diet that that you know, weren't scientists, or were, were mainly more influencers or you know, phys, you know physical trainers, personal trainers, and they would they would talk about these things that, and they'd sort of look at the studies and maybe not quite quite get them and like mispronounce mm -hmm. big words, which is always great. Yeah, yeah, you know, and. Um, and, uh, and you know, then talk about how, you know, ketosis is, uh, is like, well, you know, you're, you're tricking your body into thinking it's starving to death and you get the benefits of starving to death. It's like, wow. Okay. So it's like, apparently there's the benefit of starving to death, you know? Yeah. And, it's such, it's so, it's so moronic. Yeah, it's, it's so funny. And like, I remember hearing it from, from one guy and I was just like, and I got so upset. I was just like, you tell me one, one benefit of starving to death, except you're now dead. <laughs> And I don't have to listen to this stupid crap anymore. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, but they said, so you'll talk about tricking your body into thinking it's starving to death. It's like, I'm sorry. Which is silly. Yeah. You know, in fact, Anthony, if you'll allow me to riff for a second, the mm -hmm. irony is that if you're producing ketones, you're not starving. So the right. difference between fasting and starvation is have you run out of fat? And then yeah. the moment you run out of fat, on your body. Now you can't make ketones to feed the brain because when you're fasting, the brain is producing about is the ketones are providing about 70% of all of the brain's energy. And so it's glucose need is very, very low, which is good. Um, because if you're not eating anything, you know, you're going to, especially carbs. Well, then it's nice that the brain's glucose demand has gone down. Once you start running out of fat, your production of ketones plummet. And now the brain can't get any ketones and has now become totally dependent on glucose. Mm. And guess who has to start paying that? Well, it's muscle. And so now you start stripping the amino acids from the muscle in order to make all of this glucose for the brain to eat. So the irony is they say, well, ketones, it's like you're tricking your body into starvation. In fact, ironically, having ketones means you're not in starvation. You're fasting. That's the difference between a fast and starvation. Do you have enough fat to make ketones to fuel the brain? Then it's a fast. Even if it's a 380 day fast, like that fellow did in Scotland or Ireland or Wales, I think it was Wales actually, a documented fast of over a year. He of course was morbidly obese. It was under medical supervision with water, minerals, vitamins, et cetera. But the fact that he kept making ketones meant he didn't lose any muscle. And indeed he didn't because you don't cut muscle unless you're starving and starvation happens when you run out of fat and you can't make ketones. Right. So yeah. that's the irony. So not that guy yeah. was a double moron. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, but that's the thing. It's just like, you know, you're, you're not, you're not going to be that smart. You're not, you're not out thinking, you know, nature and how, how the, yep. the, the world works. Like you're just not that smart. And if you, if you were smart, you you'd look at this, and be like, okay, well, this is a natural process. Let's try to emulate it as close, as closely as possible and, 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 and achieve optimal health that way. Um, yeah. Well, in fact, Anthony, just to be fair, if you're smart, you probably wouldn't call a guy a moron. So I'll, I should temper my language a little bit. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I, you know, again, like it, you know, what you said before, you know, we we can forgive them in their ignorance because you know, you know yeah. some people are trying to just suss this stuff out. Um, but it you know it does it does sort of you know make make you frustrated sometimes when you, when you see people commenting on the, these uh, you know, these systems that you know that that they exist in a textbook. Like you can read these things and, uh, and you can understand them. Uh, you know, they, if you want to do the work, but you know, people say, Oh, you know, it, like it's the old saying, a little bit of information is a dangerous thing. Um, they, they get a small piece of this. They think they understand, uh, the entire picture and, and maybe they do, but likely they don't. And, and, you know, Thomas Sowell, you know, one of my favorite authors, uh, said, Oh, now you're talking my language, man. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, you know, he says it, it, it takes a lot of knowledge to uh, understand just how ignorant we are. 
And, and I, you know, I noticed that firsthand when I was in medical school, I got about halfway through my second year in medical school. And leading up to that, I was, I was just, you know, so, so excited about all the things I was learning and understanding, like, wow, I really, I've got a lot of control over all these sorts of things. I know about this thing and this thing and this thing. This is, this is so great learning about how the body works and about how to you know, treat diseases. And I got halfway through my second year of medical school and, and it just sort of, I felt like I was, I was building up to a crescendo and all of a sudden I was, I got to the top of this hill and I was able to see out of this vast mountain range of things I did not understand and know. And I, it, it was very humbling. And I just looked at that and went, okay, I need to just, sh- you know, shut up and, and read for a number. Yeah. Of- yeah. 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 You know, well said. I just, I just don't, I don't know enough yet. And, uh, and so that's, um, unfortunately not everyone gets to that point <laughs> that they, yeah. they, they sort of see like, wow, I, I really don't know enough about this. Um, that sort of, that sort of, uh, leads me to my next question talking about, you know, the optimal, uh, energy source of the brain. You know, when I was taking biochemistry, you know, 20, 22 years ago, we, we were taught it was ketones, you know, that your brain optimally runs on ketones. It pre- preferentially runs on ketones, especially when you're in a, in a so-called fasting state, which I, I argue is not a fasting state. I argue that that's our primary metabolic state. Mm-hmm. That's the metabolic state of most animals in the wild. If you look at them, yeah, that's our natural state. Our natural state isn't mm-hmm. putting something in our mouth. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and specifically not putting carbohydrates in our mouth and, and, and getting into a hyperinsulinemic uh, state. Um, but that, this is this is something that people talk about that 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 glucose is the brain's uh, primary energy source. What what do you say about that? Yeah, well, yeah, of course, I, I love this. In fact, it's very very timely. I just got back from a meeting where I presented um, at a, a science meeting, and it was it was the the meeting of the American Association of Biological Anthropologists. Now. The acute listeners in the audience are thinking, anthropologist, Bickman's not an anthropologist. I'm not. I don't study human evolution at all. And I'm so grateful that I don't have to focus my career on a theory and that I can focus on just hard, cold facts. But even still, I was so intrigued that they would reach out and invite me. And I felt compelled to remind or inform the person reaching out to me, I am not an anthropologist. I didn't add that I I'm glad I wasn't, but uh, but I, I I just felt compelled. <laughs> Look, I'm a nutrient biochemist, you know, mitochondrial physiologist. What what do you, what do I have to say? And, and he had said, I'm aware, I'm familiar with your work on brain energy use. I am putting together a session, and and it's all about the changes in human diets over you know our ancestor diets um, over these periods of evolution. Uh, and and I want you to talk about the brain acting as a hybrid. And in my preparation for this talk. I found uh, a paper that had been published in like the most dynamite anthropology journals, the Journal of Human Evolution, I think it was called. I don't really remember, but it's their really great journal that everyone wants to publish in. And in that article, I found two, it was all about how the Neanderthal diet and the development of the brain. And they had two comments in there, both of which reflected a profound ignorance by stating that dietary carbohydrates are essential and were essential to our ancestors in the development of their brain. Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor at Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is to just eat meat. For those times that you're out hiking, road tripping, or stuck at work and you want a nutritious snack that is just meat, fat, and salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. So I like this product not because it's just pure meat, but also because I want the Carnivore Market to thrive as well. And the more we support meat only products, the more meat only products that will be available in the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to get behind, check it out using my discount code Anthony to get 10% off, which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25% off total. All right. Thanks guys. And I actually cited that article and then I just kind of hopefully tactfully just said, this is wrong. Um, and, And then shared with them a quote by the National Academy of Sciences in the U.S., stating that the lower limit of carbohydrates in the human diet is zero. Yeah. In other words, there is no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. And the whole the idea that the human brain evolved because our ancestors ate a lot of carbs, that's utterly ridiculous. And that's basically the impression I gave the audience, hopefully not too offensively, but I had many, many people come up to me afterwards, very, very grateful 
um, maybe the, the haters and the detractors didn't bother coming up, but no one said, no, no one uttered a negative word. It was just absolute gratitude at learning this reality of human biology and physiology, which is that, yes, it, it's because they mistake dietary carbohydrates with blood glucose, that right. it appears what does appear to be the case is that the brain has some demand for some glucose. That appears to be accurate, although the lower limit is unknown. Early work by a, a fasting physiologist named George Cahill, he was putting people's glucose down to like 20 milligrams per deciliter, which most people would say, you're unconscious, you're in a coma and you're going to die. And these people, because they'd been long-term fast adapted, which I would say ketone adapted, they appeared to be no deficit to cognition. I mean, that's a pretty bloody low level of, of glucose. But nevertheless, let's kind of grant that side of it, that the brain has some requirement for some glucose. Well, it is a minimal requirement because if you take a body that has five millimolar glucose and you start increasing the ketones to one or two or even three millimolar, which is still less than the five millimolar of glucose. So there's still less of the ketone in the blood than there is the glucose. By then the brain has already dramatically shifted its energy use. And even though the ketone may be less than half of what the glucose is in the blood, it's now providing double, you know, twice as much of energy to the brain as the glucose is. So if the brain has any preferential fuel, it is absolutely for the ketone. And even further, it's, the closest I can come to kind of human or anthropology at all, and I don't want to get any closer, is what we see in infants. You can take a newborn baby and the baby can breastfeed or bottle feed. And then within an hour, the baby is in a deeper state of ketosis than an adult would be after fasting for 20, uh, for, for a full day. I mean, it is, it really, that baby will be at two millimolar ketones in an hour. And an adult, and for me, if I want to get to 2 million, I got to fast for like 36 hours to get to that point, you know? And, and I mean, so if, if there's any natural state, kind of back to our conversation a moment ago, it is clearly that a natural state is a state of ketosis. And, and I think even more, and I'll flirt again in the waters of anthropology, I'll dabble my toes, um, but it's, it's reflected in humans. We are such totally unique creatures where we are the only land-based mammals born obese, and the only animal who has a brain that is larger than the birth canal, much to mother's chagrin. But that means we have these very big hungry brains and all of this chubby, adorable baby fat that is just producing ketones like gangbusters to fuel the brain growth. And if you have a baby that is born premature and lacks sufficient adipose tissue, it is much more likely that they're going to develop neurological disorders. All the more reason to chubby up that baby as quickly as you can. Wow. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. And we, and we do see this in, in um, uh, you know, working neurosurgery and uh, you know, we get a lot of premature babies that have quite a lot of problems and, and th that come around with uh, being just a, a, a premature child and, and neurological issues and neurodevelopmental uh, delays as well. And that can, that could certainly uh, explain much of that, that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's another thing too, you know, people, people talk, I, I remember reading, um, something that uh, an article that uh, probably in one of these, these anthropology journals, uh, a friend of mine sent me when I was, when I was first doing this, they said, Oh, well, you know, look at this study. And I think like her cousin had actually written it. Um, and it was, it was all about honey and how, they, how they're arguing that honey was probably the causative factor of our brains growing so big because oh it, my it's gosh. the most nutrient dense is the most calorically dense substance. And my initial response was like, do you know what the word density means? You know, no, it's, it's, I know. You know, it's calories That's what I'm talking brain. about. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's like, just stay in your lane. Yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. you, you, you anthropologists and, and in all, in all seriousness, they were incredible scientists and I was thrilled to meet them, but clearly there's just this bit of a disconnect. I shouldn't say stay in your lane. That's part of the fun of academia. It's going out of your lane for a moment, but mm. to make that kind of statement about honey, yeah. Look, I'm not trying to declare war on honey. I know that in the carnivore community, there are some very outspoken advocates. I think it's clear that our ancestors, our hunter gatherers, it's clear that if people can get honey, they're going to love it and they want to eat honey. But to then say that that was a, the like fundamental food and brain development, well, the brain isn't made of honey. You know, yeah. the brain is made of proteins and fats, especially a lot of fat. Mm. I mean, and you need these essential fats from meat 
in order to have sufficient brain growth, you don't get any of those from honey. And I'm not trying to declare war on honey, but to say that that was an essential, uh, that it was a necessary part of our ancestors diet, that to me is just silly. Yeah. Well, and also, you know, you know, you know, people obviously like the Inuits living in uh, by the North Pole or, or our ancestors coming through the ice ages, you know, there was no honey and, yeah, and there was right. no fruit. And so, you know, I, I'm certainly in the, the other side of the camp where I'm saying, you know, honey is actually really bad. <laughs> it's bad for you. Fruit, fruit can be bad for you. Fructose, you know, Dr. Lustig from UCSF has done yep. yeoman's work uh, showing just how harmful uh, fructose is, but then some people say, well, in the context of, of honey in this, you know, in, in you know, and, and fruit, you know, maybe it works differently. And, and, and that may be true, but they haven't actually provided any evidence that it does. Uh, and so in, until that research comes out, uh, you know, I'm still going to be, uh, you know, erring on the side yep. of, of caution and, and avoiding uh, fructose. 